Let's try that again. Good morning, Kent Cuff. It's good to be with you. I always love starting out that way. Um, all right, this morning we're going to take a look at a passage from Galatians 5, beginning in verse 13, going through verse 26. Galatians 5, 13 to 26. Paul writes, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Please join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O Lord, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space, where heaven and earth meet. Amen. Friends, did you realize that we are created for community? It is hardwired into our DNA. And one of the ways that we know this is because we as Christians affirm and believe that God, him, God himself exists in community, in the community of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, that God exists in this community. And since we are made in God's image, we therefore are created for community. And I believe, friends, that this creation is reflected, or that creation reflects this design. So I was reading uh, a while back, I read this great novel called The Overstory. And uh, I won't get into it because it's a pretty thick novel and it's very complex. But one of the stories in this, sto in this novel was about a woman who was um, a forest, um, a forester, a tree doctor, I don't remember what the, what the uh, correct term is, but she studied forests, and part of what she discovered was that, uh, that forests are organisms, that they exist in community. That they're, like when you look at forests, that the root systems of the different trees in the forest become um, kind of entangled, and that one uh, thing that happens that I thought was fascinating is that trees, when they're being attacked by pests or disease, release pheromones that then other trees pick up that warn them of this impending attack. Pretty fascinating stuff. Uh, apparently, roots, root systems grow fungus that are connected to individual tree roots, and then the, that fungus trades minerals for carbohydrates, which creates a network in the root system that connects trees and helps them all to thrive. 
It's like, right? Because what we were kind of taught, or at least I think what we pick up in our, the way we look at the world, is we look at a forest and it's just a bunch of individual trees. And so what does it matter if this one dies or this one's attacked or we cut down that one or whatever it is? But we don't, we don't see that interconnectedness. So friends, when Paul talks about uh, that all of creation is groaning for the redemption of Christ, he's not kidding, right? It talks to each other, and I think it probably talks to God. That's a whole different topic for another day. But we have been exploring the last several weeks what it means to be a covenant church. We've talked about our affirmations. And we've, we've looked at each one as core values of a covenant church, if you will. Today we're going to close out that series by thinking about Kent Cove's mission statement, which is, we are changed by Jesus to change the world. To be changed by Jesus to change the world. That is the mission statement of Kent Covenant Church. Now, one of the things I love about this mission statement is that it encapsulates both the mission of the church to make disciples through the great commandment and great commission and to be personally changed by Jesus. It encapsulates the whole thing. Now, you have heard me say in this series earlier on that one of my favorite sayings about the church from a great old German theologian is that... um, Mission is to the church as a fire is to burning. Mission is to the church as a fire is to burning. Another way to think about that would be to say that the mission of the church was set two centuries ago, or not centuries, millennia ago, by Jesus, right? Jesus says, gives two commands about the church. The first is at the end of Matthew, the Great Commission, where he says, go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he also says that the the greatest commandment is to love God and love neighbor, right? And I think this mission statement encapsulates both of those things, to make disciples to be transformed, to love God, and to love neighbor. But in order for us to begin to live into that mission, to be changed by Jesus, to change the world, we have to think about that both and nature of this uh, mission statement, this idea that it's both personal and communal, that it happens to us individually, but also in community. Now, just for reference, I thought it was, uh, this is great, and I don't know, some, you know, sometimes uh, Kent Cubs a, a bit of a hard place to preach, because uh, one, you have to follow people like Mr. Kevin and Pastor Trina, like every week, you know, sometimes I sit and I think, well, maybe I should just, I should just stay down here, because that was pretty good, right? But Janith, this last week, asked our high school students what they think our mission statement means okay so I'm going to share some of these uh, with you because they're they're just fantastic what does it mean first of all to be changed by Jesus Um, one student said it means coming out of darkness and living in light Uh, another one said finding a purpose and living in that purpose Uh, removing distractions that pull you away from God to be made new in your attitude and thinking Um, being a good testimony and changing your priorities. Uh, What does it mean to change the world? Here were some of their answers for that. Proactive care towards your neighbor. Okay. (laughs) All right. Uh, Leading by example, loving people who are hard to love, being quick to forgive, being compassionate, um, sharing what you've received from God, Loving your neighbor despite what they have done. I love that one. That's a constant practice. But I thought those were pretty fantastic, right? So this morning, though, we want to think about what does it mean to be changed by Jesus? And to do that, I want to look at this text that we read from Galatians. Now, one of the things you'll pick up as we look at this text is that um, Paul 
is writing to a community in trouble. Okay, the church in Galatia was in trouble. There was conflict. There were two parties that were kind of um, disagreeing about what it meant to follow Jesus. Uh, and Paul is writing to remind them of, of what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to be free, what it means to um, not be under the law, all of those kinds of things. Um, and he reminds them in verse, verses 13 and 14, he says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one, other, one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, one of the things about living in community is that we get to practice that command, right? When people ask me, why is it important for me to be involved in a local congregation? Why is it important for me to join a local church? It is because I believe that one of the things that the church offers is an opportunity over and over again to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we can do this in a lot of different ways, but where this really gets tested is where we rub up against one another, right? Where we're living together in community and we're worshiping together and we're not agreeing about everything. Now, I know that's probably not an issue here because... You know, everybody is so nice and we all get along, um, right? But this is the reality, that this has been going on from the very beginning, right? That, That Jesus himself, when he gathered his disciples... The image of this this ragtag group of of people that he gathered around him couldn't have been more diverse, and some of them diametrically politically opposed. Now, that doesn't sound familiar, right? I mean, so this idea of living in community and loving our neighbor is one way that we begin to be changed by Jesus. And we know that this community in Galatia, the church in Galatia was in trouble because of what Paul says in verse 15. Can you imagine uh, this warning coming from um, Greg Yee, our conference superintendent, who writes us a letter and says, Kent Cove, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. What was going on in this church? Right? There was some real conflict happening here. There's tension. Nerves are frayed. There are things being said that are hurtful. There's real disagreement. And Paul is warning them to love one another, reminding them, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, you're going to destroy yourselves. So Paul is, one of, is a leader who's not afraid to lean into these difficult conversations and to call people out. Then Paul goes on as, he talks, as he's talking with this community, and he's trying to describe for them what it looks, to, looks like to live a life that, where you have been changed by Jesus. And he begins by, by pointing out, starting from the negative. He says in, in verses 19 and 20, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage... Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read these lists, I think, who are these people? (laughs) Right? Because most of us, let's be honest, you know, we're not struggling with... um, drunkenness and orgies and the like, whatever that is. You know, there's this reality of um, these, this list, this catalog of vices that Paul, um, you know, runs through here. But I want us to think of, because one of the things that happens, I think, when we read these lists is if, if we're living even marginally moral lives, it's 
it's somewhat easy to hear that list and go, yeah, okay, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Not my problem, right? Um, I mean, there are certain ones that might be trickier than others, but generally speaking, you know, some of those big ones are not things that, that a lot of us struggle with, but I want you to notice something about them. Every one of these sins is self-centered. Every one of these sins is self-centered. And one of the things that I think this, these lists point out, and one of the things that I think is going on in the church in Galatia, is that autonomy, or an obsession with it, brings us places we ought not go. You see, what's happened in, in the church in Galatia is you have two factions that are, that are duking it out. You have one faction who are who, what Paul calls the Judaizers, and they're telling these Gentile Christians that the only way that they can be saved and follow Jesus is to be under the law as the Jews were, right? But then on the other extreme, you've got uh, this party that's apparently uh, kind of the free, well, I'm going to call them the free love party, okay? They're just like, you know, kind of anything goes, Christ died to set us free, so it doesn't matter what we do, we can do whatever we want, right? And what Paul is saying is like, oh, no, 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 you're, you, Christ has set you free to be free, right? So you're not to be under the law, but neither have you been set free to do whatever you want, right? To, to serve yourself. And so Paul is trying to get them to understand that discipleship, following Jesus, must confront the idolatry of the self, at least as we understand it in our culture. You see, part of what's happening is there's a, a tendency for us, especially I think in the church, to focus on the salacious sins. I love that word, salacious, right? On those sins that are, you know, like the really bad ones, the really naughty sins. We focus on those, sexual morality, all of those kinds of things. We especially like to focus on those things if they, happen, if they don't happen to be the sins that we ourselves struggle with. That's the, religious, that's the religious person's sweet spot, right? To focus on the sins they don't struggle with because then they can feel, we can feel really good about ourselves and how good we are and how moral we are. There is a sense that we have to um, notice that many or most of the sins listed in this list that I, this long list that I just have read a couple times now, what are they doing? Well, we already noted that they're all self-centered. We also, if you pay attention, you also notice that they are, um, every one of them that's listed is corrosive to community and relationship. Every one of those sins in that list is corrosive to community and relationship. Not just our relationship to God, but our relationship to each other. Our relationship to our spouse, our relationship to our, to our community, um, our relationship with others. You'll notice that the um, one commentator points out that the first three sins um, are violations of sexual morality, and then there are two sins from the religious realm, and then eight sins pertaining to conduct in regard to other human beings. In other words, social sins. And then there are two typically pagan sins, drunkenness and the revelings accompanying it. One of the interesting fe features of this conversation of freedom and the law, of how do we live lives that are changed by Jesus, is, and this is a little bit tricky, is that the drive, the thing that makes us go after that, the animating feature of both the law and license ends up being the same thing. And what is that drive or animating feature? It's lack of love for neighbor. It's a me first attitude. It's a, it doesn't matter what anybody else wants or anybody else needs. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to do what feels good to me. And what happens as we struggle with this tension between freedom and law is that we lose sight of that. So for those who clamor for law and order we uh, easily lose sight of love for neighbor. 
And those who clamor for, you know, kind of do whatever you want, whatever feels good, uh, lose sight of love for neighbor as well. Because on this end, it becomes all about protecting and fear and all of those things so that we can be safe. And, it, and, and ultimately, what is that about? Well, ever, it's about me being safe. I'm not so much worried about you being safe. I'm worried about me being safe. And so then I lose sight of love for neighbor. On this side, it's all about what feels good to me and what I want to do and whether it hurts somebody else or not. doesn't matter. Same drive, right? So Paul then wants us to not focus on that struggle in the sense of um, figuring it out. He wants us to recognize that if we are truly by, changed by Jesus, that we will demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, right? The natural outcome of being changed by Jesus is the fruit of the Spirit. Paul in 22 to 26, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Notice a couple things about these fruits. The first three of these fruits of the Spirit... Uh, one commentator notes that these first three appear to comprise Christian habits of the mind. Love, joy, peace. Right? Love, joy, peace. Their primary direction is Godward. The second set concerns the Christian in relationship to others and our social virtues. And then the last three concern the Christian at, in relation to themselves. Isn't that interesting? The first three are directed towards God. Love, joy, peace. That's the vertical relationship. The next group is uh, social. It's community. Peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So the last three, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, are reflections of who we are as people. That because we follow Jesus and Jesus has transformed us, we are faithful, gentle, and in control of ourselves. And in our relationships with one another, we experience peace, forbearance, kindness, and goodness. But here's the thing. So what does all this mean and how is it that this happens? Well, I think... One of the, the things that's easy to overlook in this passage is to recognize that fruit is produced naturally, right? Have you ever seen an apple tree or a grapevine just really working to produce fruit? No. Fruit is the natural outcome of growth. As the, as the tree or the vine grows, it produces Fruit. It doesn't have to think about it or strive for it. It just happens because of that is what it's made for. Now, this does not, this is not to say that stress or hardship doesn't exist or that life doesn't impact how fruit, you know, appears in our life. But here's the thing. I've mentioned before uh, that I uh, worked in the wine industry for a while. And so while I was working in the wine industry, I learned a bit about winemaking and, and vineyards and growing stuff. And here's one of the simple lessons that you learn. That one of the things that w the seasons when you get the best wine are oftentimes the season when there's drought because the vines have to work hard to grow. But the fruit that you get out of that is more robust. You get less of it, but the fruit that you do get is more robust. It's more flavorful. It's, it it um, pops more, right? 
So it's not that life isn't hard sometimes. It's not that we don't experience challenge in our lives, but it's in those seasons that our roots go deeper and the fruit, while maybe less, is more intense. Another piece that's important to recognize as we think about these um, these fruits, one of the things I think that, that we could do uh, more with would, would enhance our witness in the world is to recognize what it truly means to have joy. You know, when I think about conversations I've had with folks who are either not in the church or are not Christians, and I, you know, ask them, you know, what their experience of Christians or the church has been, you know what word I have never, ever heard? Those are a joyful bunch of people. Those people are so filled with joy, I could hardly stand it. In fact, I couldn't stand it. I had to leave. It was too much. Never. Never once. No, and I'm not standing here as a person who, you know, I think my family would attest is, you know, necessarily, you know, a zippy, uh, you know, happy-go-lucky. But here's the thing. Part of the problem of us not experiencing that joy, one is discipleship. We need more of it, right? We need to be discipled more by Jesus than we are by other things. But the other is that I think sometimes we equate joy with happiness, We equate joy with being, you know, kind of um, cheerleader, you know. Let's go, guys! Right? That's not joy. Joy is a deep-seated assurance that all things shall be well. Because God is in control. Because Jesus is alive. Right? We know that in the end, everything will turn out. And so we rest in that assurance. That doesn't mean we get to ignore the hard things. That is not at all what I am saying. But what I am saying is that we need to, to kind of separate that idea out. So that when people say or, or look at the church, they don't see a sense of fear. They don't see people who are grasping for control, who are grasping because they're afraid of something. They see people who are deeply secure and know that God is in control, regardless of what's going on in the world. So friends, what does it mean to live by the Spirit? Well, verse 24 We've talked about we don't produce fruit through effort. It's produced by Christ's work in us. Eugene Peterson translates verse 24 this way, Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good, crucified. You see, friends, so much of the energy that we spend in our discipleship I think we direct it towards us trying to not want things or to not do things instead of resting in the fact that when Christ uh, was on the cross, he reminded us or he proclaimed, it is finished. Paul is reminding us that those desires of the flesh that Paul is talking about in Galatians 5, they are crucified. It is crucified. We just need to remind ourselves every day of that fact and accept the work of Christ on our behalf. You see, here's the thing, friends. All of this begins with one thing. That is to accept the relentless tenderness of Jesus. You see, the fruits of the Spirit... We don't don't produce them under our own effort. We produce them because we have been redeemed by Jesus. So as we begin to do that, the first step in that transformation is accepting that relentless tenderness of Jesus. 
that Jesus who has pursued us through all the days and seasons of our life. No matter where we have wandered, no matter where we have gone, no matter what mistakes we have made, no matter what bad choices, no matter what good choices, the reality is, is that all we can do is to give in to that relentless tenderness. Friends, God loves you. He wants relationship with you. And He wants to see these fruits of the Spirit evident in your life. He wants you to be changed by Jesus. And the first step is accepting that radical acceptance. And so I hope that as you move through your week, that you'll spend some time reflecting on what it means to be redeemed. What it means that God loves you so much that He purchased you at a price. And that He wants to see your life produce the, this kind of fruit. That's what it means to be changed by Jesus. And then as we live into those things, then we can change the world, or God can change the world through us. So please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love for us. God, we thank you that no matter where we have been, no matter where we've gone, no matter what mistakes we have made, that you have been right there calling us home through the love of Jesus. God, as we move into our weeks this week, may you help us to open our hearts to accept your relentless tenderness, to allow that transformation to begin, that we might see your fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, more evident in our own personal lives and in our life, in our life as a community. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.